Hi, everybody. Um, this is Lama Justin. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Is the sound quality all right? Um, so I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me okay. Okay, great. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, so, um, you know, thank you for coming. Um, Mahamudra is the practice of um, radical acceptance. And I am here stuck in a car. <laughs> um, not where I was thought I would be um, to, you know, host this session um, of teachings. Um, so, um, you know, everybody needs to uh, embrace radical acceptance from time to time when things don't turn out um, as you would like them to. Um, <clears throat> for today's session, um, I would like to uh, start off with a little bit of practice and then um, move into a little bit more teaching on Tilopa Six Nails. And then start looking at um, the kind of traditional aspects of shamatha practice. Um, and, and in doing that, I'll, I'll share um, uh, much of what Bok Rinpoche um, taught me. Um, and, then, and then we'll also touch a little bit on uh, awareness practices um, in relationship to uh, the practice of Mahamudra. So, um, I want to also just thank everyone for rolling with this time change for this um, and um, for people like Anjana and others who may be in Europe. Um, this is also a way to kind of make sure that um, you have access um, and don't have to always be staying up really late to, um, you know, catch what we're offering. Um, the So let's start with a little bit of practice, okay? So try and... Uh, take a moment to get as comfortable as you can right now. Um, take a moment to settle your body. And then spend some time also looking at what settling your mind looks like right now. And take some some deep breaths, inhalation and exhalation. And just allow yourself to settle in as if you're returning back to the ground. So that could be the actual earth, which we're asking its presence to wit bear witness to our meditation practice. It's also a way of grounding ourselves so that we can better understand what the experience of stability is like. Of course, this is also a, a, a technique through which we can begin to connect with the power and the impact of our practice. Meditation practice is not um, without impact. It's not without its results. And in this moment, I ask everyone to take some time to bring your awareness to your breathing. And gently allow yourself to place your awareness on every inhalation and every exhalation as they happen. A 
allow yourself to bring your awareness to sound. And as you remain mindful of your breathing, also try and remain aware of every sound that's arising within the space of your meditation experience. Internal sounds, external sounds. every kind of sound. And then slowly bring yourself back to this session. Okay. All right. Good God. Um, okay. How's this now? I think it. I think it's okay. Um, so, um, no, not yet. That's weird. My it says my camera's working. Um, but can you hear me then, at least? Yay. Okay, I'm back. Thank you, Tim. Um, so, 
you know, experiences like this are good because, um, you know, frustration can arise and um, frustration um, is something that we come into relationship uh, with in our practice quite frequently. So I'm going to ask everybody to embrace whatever is happening right now. Um, uh, Anne does not see me or hear me. Um, uh, because frustration is inevitable. Uh, frustration is something that um, arises during meditation sessions. Um, sometimes what, what is happening is um, exactly what we think it should be. And then at other times, um, you know, we become very distracted or the circumstances around us, um, you know, change quite a bit. Um, and so I'm going to ask everybody to practice with us um, today. And so should we get cut off? And um, that's okay. It's just another time to um, practice nature of mind right? and to kind of get a better sense of our reactivity and, and where the reactions come from, right? And, and what the reactions lead to. Um, because again, you know, we've, we've been habituated perhaps culturally um, to assume that meditation is something to be done in a um, safe place or a place that's comfortable or a place that's dedicated to meditation. And, um, that's not always the case. That's not always possible. Um, and so I just want to name that um, because that's that's real. Um, and the tradition is full of uh, great masters, both um, female and male, um, who were able to engage directly that which is difficult. Um, so in my case, uh, my schedule is very changeable, um, and I've learned to let go of. Um, I've learned to accept it. Let's say, you know, and to let go of um, frustrations when change happens, because change is constant. And what's particularly important within the context of Mahamudra uh, is that without the ability to embrace change, our practice becomes filled with anger, with frustration, with, um, de you know, feeling dejected. Um, every possible emotion connected to things not working out the way we want them to. And the thing about life, um, and, and I know many people, because we're all living, have experienced this, is that it's the same thing with life. Um, life is not always uh, what we make it out to be. Um, and having spent time um, you know, working in hospice, I spent um, a number of years with people who were actively dying, who were trying to, um, A, make sense of their lives, and then B, in some cases, um, get out of this place of frustration, um, if possible, um, that they found themselves in the midst of. Right, so that could be the nature of um, one's decline, physically, emotionally, mentally. Um, it can be, um, wow, I never thought it would be like this kind of thing. Uh, and there's a story that I, uh, I shared in Modern Tantric Buddhism about a Zen teacher who I was um, uh, a chaplain to, um, for whom that was the primary issue, was I never thought it would be like this. And I never thought my death would be as ordinary as it's turning out to be. Um, so this is to say that while you know, we can definitely say that all spiritual practice um, allows us the ability to um, begin to do a lot of this work, right? the work that we find um, leading up to death. Um, Mahamudra in particular, because it 
asks us to remain open and accepting and present with whatever is arising within our mind stream and our experience of our relationship to everything around us is very, very uh, profoundly beneficial in preparation for uh, the death process. Um, and I say that now on an island that has, um, you know, between 800,000 and a million people buried here. And I also say that because fresh in my mind is a meditation uh, instruction. Um, we, we find it within the um, Milam Chu text um, that we've been using, um, but I've also, also encountered it in other locations um, where we're instructed uh, in practicing um, resting our mind in its essential nature as to practice as if we're a, char a, a corpse laying in a charnel ground, right? So that, that level of finality, relative finality, right? Finality for the, the physical body. Everything stopped, you've died, right? And so it's not that the mind stops, but to cut discursive analysis, and it's not so much that we are actively seeking to go out and cut it, but we allow mind to become spacious. And that spaciousness is what allows for what we call cutting the root of discursiveness, right? When we're able to focus and appreciate and experience the container that the mind is for all that arises, then we're able to cut discursive relationship to phenomena. And so that discursiveness is, um, you know, falling back into the, uh, you know, endless comparisons that uh, we engage in um, at any different, any, any moment in, in life, um, uh, or the desire for things to be another way. Oh, I wish, you know, I wish I was not on this island. I wish I was where I wanted to be, to be able to uh, be properly situated for this teaching. You know, oh, uh, I wish, you know, Lama Justin didn't have so many technical difficulties because this is frustrating. <laughs> you know, like this, these kinds of, you know, on, on these levels, right? Um, and so that instruction, you know, it's one line, <clears throat> you know, rest your mind like, the cor like a corpse resting in a charnel ground, that kind of stillness. And silence, there's no mental activity. just being there. There's another, um, you know, instruction like this that um, one finds in um, an, another text. Um, and um, there are two um, instructions that I like from this text. And one of them is to um, rest your mind as if you were a bee stuck in honey. Right, so you're just stuck there. The more you fight, right, the more you try and get unstuck, the more stuck you get. You know, if, if you were a bee and just your leg was stuck and then you start to, you know, get frenetic, right, a push or fight the process, then it's likely that your wing will then get stuck. And then there's even less you know, ability to fight, right? And we're constantly fighting, which is what the, um, you know, why Mahamudra is so profound is, you know, we are wrestling with and not accepting most things as they arise. And so what does it mean and what does it feel like to, to just rest our mind, rest into the experience of the moment without 
and going back to Tulopa Six Nails without this kind of instantaneous return to playing out past stories or past um, you know, analytic descriptors of the, you know what's going on right now. Um, what is it like to not engage with any kind of expectation, any kind of uh, um, desire, fear about the way things are going to pan out? And what is it like to just naturally be in this moment, free and open? without trying to figure out what to do or without, you know, getting all wrapped up in the you know, philosophical aspects of, okay, like, you know, what, what stream of, um, you know, philosophical thought does this align with when you're just resting, right? A corpse in a charnel ground doesn't have the ability to enter into philosophical debate unless it's a zombie. <laughs> um, a bee stuck in honey is not served well by analyzing its situation. And then this other instruction that, that I, I find particularly, you know, visual, but that anybody who's done physical labor can, can probably identify with this, is um, to rest your mind like a worker at the end of a long, hard day. And that level of rest when our body is physically tired and we're ready to just settle into an experience of stability. Right, we're ready to just kick back, right, lean back on the couch, lay on the couch, hop into bed, just sit down, you know, on the grass. Because we feel um, exhausted right? and that word is really good like exhausted what is it like for the mind to exhaust its own frenetic arising how does that manifest and when we engage in the practice of shamatha you know the practice of um learning to develop a relationship to <clears throat> mind in the way that thinking happens, right? the way that thoughts and reactivity arise, our own individual relationship to that train of thought. You know, sometimes it's dull. Sometimes it's very active. Sometimes it's speedy, it almost feels instantaneous. Things just pop up, pop up, pop up. Right? But when we're, when we're able to sit with our mind and get to know it, it begins to exhaust itself a little bit. And as this process of you know, constant reactivity slowly you know, sometimes quickly exhausts itself. We move into an experience that's very different than just, you know, one thought after the other, one sensation leading to an association, leading to a memory, leading to a hope, leading to a dream, leading to a fear, you know, just, this, you know, amazing. I mean, it is amazing, um, you know, creative, cognitive experience. But when we're able to allow all of that to settle, right? so we're not actively seeking to still the mind, we're seeking to understand the mind. And by doing that, our relationship to mind changes. And we're not so um, negatively impacted by things as they arise, right? And that allows us the experience of spaciousness, which then allows us to stretch out even more, which we're going to do in a little bit. Um, but before we go further, um, I wanna see if there are any questions. 
I, I kind of prefer um, teaching over Zoom because then I can kind of see people's faces. Um, and over Crowdcast, I can't see you. Um, so it's hard to know if people are falling asleep <laughs> or if they're, you know, pulling their hair out um, because what I'm saying doesn't make sense um, or, or anything in between. Um, so, you know, on the bottom, there's a place where you can ask a question. Um, so go ahead and, and do that if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, um, if there aren't any questions, and we can move into another meditation session. And um, a tiny bit of instruction first on technique and then meditation session, and then we'll come back. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Any specific questions? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Uh, let's see. So Sam says, first of all, thanks uh, for this really great imp improvised session, which has been so helpful. I have a question about effort. How to find that balance between too much and not enough. Okay. So, of course, so there, there are many different ways of looking at effort, right? Um, in the beginning, you know, we need a certain element of discipline and a little bit of, you know, effort or energy kind of put into our meditation practice, um, especially because it's new, right? Um, we, um, the process of familiarization with things that are new are kind of twofold. On one level, sometimes the newness is very exciting and we're just automatically inspired, and that's 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 wonderful. Um, and then and then for those who you know have had that experience, we also kind of you know recognize that that that's not necessarily the most reliable um, kind of fuel, so to speak, because it's it's fleeting, right? After a while, um, sometimes we do this, um, you know, you do this meditation several times, and then kind of the new excitingness of it wears off, and then we're back exactly where we started. Um, so we need to apply effort, but it also needs to be gentle, um, because, uh, overexertion actually leads to a sense of, um, overfocus, um, which is a form of trying to kind of manipulate or change what is happening, right? So this is why, um, the instruction on resting like a, a tired worker or laborer is particularly useful to me because there's no um there's no implication that there's work to be done right our meditation practice is about just letting ourselves um rest right with a, a certain amount of focus right or or, or effort but not um but it's mostly resting it's mostly observing. Um, sometimes when when I teach this, I'll um, ask people to rest as if you're a bird in a tree. Right. So, if you see a bird on a branch in a tree, um, you know it will be doing many different things, right? But they're always alert, right? And you'll see them just focus, you know, when they need to, so, you know, just hear a sound or perhaps see something. And, and so they're, they're always aware and they're doing things just naturally like a bird. So it's, you know, my advice is to practice like a bird, um, to not, to remain naturally aware, right? Attuned to what's happening, but without the exertion of trying to be a bird. Because you just not you know bird is naturally a bird, um, you know you are naturally you, so you don't need to be any more or less of that or put work into that. It's more um, uh, gaining familiarity with what it's like to just rest in the experience of accepting, while at the same time remaining um, aware 
of what's happening. Oops, that's um, uh, okay. Um, and then Hope asks, can you talk about the difference between Mahamudra and Shikantaza? Um, I can a little bit. I haven't practiced Shikantaza. Uh, I've, I've experienced um, it briefly. Um, uh, um, you know, years ago. Um, so it, would there be a way of just kind of focusing the, um, the question a little bit more? And then maybe if, if there's a way to kind of focus it a tiny bit more, I'll, I'll address a question that Cooper has, uh, sometimes, uh, I'm not sure if resting my mind or trying to rest my mind. Yeah, and and so this this kind of gets back to the effort thing, like you know, being, um, just being you, right? Within the the context of Mahamudra, there is um, always like you know within the, the the historical lineage, a lot of the early practitioners were these great kind of yoginis and yogis, and um, much of their practice was involved learning how to become more authentic, right? Which means just part of the process of these meditations is to recognize what it's like to, um, to just be, so to be Cooper, right? And as you sit in meditation, to be Cooper in meditation. And, and so what is that like? It also asks us to be mindful or aware of expectations. You know, and expectations around what the meditation experience should even be like. You know, what is it like to rest in meditation um, when you're well versus when you're not well physically? When we're tired or when we have lots of energy. You know, so sometimes the, um, sometimes it's easy and, and we're kind of able to gently kind of fall into that place of, of you know, recognition, of what's arising. And then other times, you know, for whatever reason, you know, our emotions just feel to kind of uh, in our body you know, um, so we're, we're just, uh, it's hard to s settle or our mind is like whipped up almost like into a froth of just, you know, so much thought activity that you just can't, you know, settle, you know, un under those circumstances, then we need to learn how to, um, how we can settle, right. And, and, those techniques sometimes they can be taught you know and other times though we really kind of need to learn for ourselves um how that um uh appears so when we when we become very kind of agitated right and our mind is very fast uh it could can, it can be peaceful or it could be angry or it could be uh, tragedy, you know, maybe you hear something that's just like terrible news, um, and your mind is, you know, bing, 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 going all over the place, right? So part of the, 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 the trying in that context uh, really is rooted in kind of understanding um, that A, you know, this, this experience we're going through, this, this mental experience and the physical experience, et cetera, whatever we're going through, uh, it will change, right? Nothing, uh, nothing lasts forever. So, so there's that. Um, and then the next piece is, how can I just be with whatever is happening? And you know, like like everything else, everything from learning to walk to talk to play a musical instrument or or create art. In the beginning, you know, sometimes things go really well, and then sometimes things seem like disasters. Or, or then, you know, we come back to this theme of frustration, and 
we get frustrated. And then the question for us in our meditation is what then? Because there is no time uh, or no aspect of our lives or no year of our lives where we've not been, um, you know, attacked, so to speak, by the reactivity of our own mind. Right? Often circumstances around us uh, are beyond our control. So then the question becomes, well, am I going to just let everything kind of take over? Or am I going to, you know, learn how to maintain an aspect of uh, control over the, my relationship to what's happening right now? And so my particular case, <laughs> I'm parked like right behind the, the truck from OCME and we're waiting for the ferry and I can see the ferry across the way, but they can't come now. And so I, right now I could be like, you know, oh, you know, you people like you get over here. Um, I need to be over there. Um, you need to do, you know what I mean? And just fight and fight and fight. Um, which, you know, sometimes we do. Um, that becomes very an automatic reaction sometimes. But then the question becomes, okay, well, here I am, and we're having this session. And um, so for that reason, but then also for for this kind of, you know, larger reason of, um, first of all, like they're busy, right? So it's not my fault. Or, and it's only my problem insofar as I cannot accept what's happening. The moment I accept, um, everything changes. Yeah, so there's um, Lama Wangju, when he gives um, the Chu Empowerment, kind of always offers this teaching, um, and it is um, rooted in um, uh, kind of like Tibetan uh, cultural uh, references. And so um, he says, uh, you know, if you're somebody who is um, a trader, you know, somebody who is a merchant, um, and you are crossing Tibet on a big yak train, um, and you're afraid of bandits because you have all this gold, right? Um, you can either practice Dharma, right, to learn how to free your mind, or you can give all the gold away <laughs> because it's the attachment to the gold which is causing this fear of being killed by bandits or having everything else stolen, you know, et cetera. So like the root of attachment, right, or the root of whatever's happening, uh, we need to be able to understand our relationship to it, right? So you don't have to, you know, throw the gold away. Um, but if you are going to hold on to the gold and you're worried about people coming to steal the gold, uh, or do bad things to get the gold, um, then the question is, can you liberate your mind right, and get free that way? Because even if you, you know, amassed an army to kind of, you know, come with you as you, as you, you know, are crossing Tibet um, to trade your goods, there, there will be some other fear that arises, um, most notably the fear of death, and and where is an army going to, you know, be of any benefit, um, you know, to us when we're when we're dying. Um, so, let me check the uh, question section. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna to go to Hope's question first. Uh, ha, I'm not sure my, what my question is. I think I'm trying to figure out. Um, uh, okay, sorry, everything moved. Um, I'm not sure what my question is. I think I'm trying to figure, it, figure out if these two practices are different since they seem similar to me uh, and I used to practice Shikantaza. To your knowledge, are they, bas are they the same basic practice? Um, well, again, it's been a while since I practiced Shikantaza, but it's it's similar in the sense of, um, and Shikantaza actually has this kind of breathing uh, component, right, where you're, you're kind of keeping your breath um, low in, in your belly. Um, there is there there are forms of Mahamudra where you kind of you know are gently manipulating um, 
your breath and doing the practice. So, so it's similar. I mean, um, probably very similar. Um, I need to do, you know, when I, when I get back home, um, I can do a little bit of looking around, um, um, and see. Yeah. I'll get back to you. Hope. Um, and then I know, oh, there we go. Anjana's question. Um, um, Let's see. So just thinking this as you're speaking, so it's like when we quote practice, uh, it is a doing that is almost, it is also <laughs> simultaneously a being like a bird in a tree. But when we are striving, grasping, efforting, it's not that ease of doing being. So yeah, um, um, that does make sense, Anjana. So yes. Um, I think part of our kind of part of the thing that gets away gets in the way of our understanding Mahamudra is that we feel we need to be exerting a change somewhere either within our experience of mind or the world around us. Um, so that is so a little bit like a petri dish. Like if you want to just let the petri dish you know, rest in its essential nature and have whatever it is arise, arise. That's um, more akin to the Mahamudra experience, right? Uh, as opposed to trying to move a process along through the introduction of external things, right? And those external things um, are, you know, manifest by stri striving, grasping, and, and efforting, as you say. Um, and, and so this is the weird joke about Mahamudra is we're already, excuse me, we're, all, we're already always in relationship to it, right? Our, our, our mind is fundamentally rooted within the experience of Mahamudra. We have just um, become so confused, um, if that makes sense, that the, the, um, we very rarely give ourselves the opportunity to understand what being, just being, actually is. What stillness actually is. Now, what patience actually is. And of course, you know what meditation actually is, because meditation isn't a um, you know a doing so much as it is a as a, a returning, right? A returning to our basic wakefulness, right? That we we've just become so um, you know, and it's not that we've been culturally conditioned on on some level we have, and there's that kind of karma level to it. Um, you know, the way that we're um, quote unquote socialized, right? And, and kind of the, the habitual um, kind of assumptions that we are, we create and project onto the world based on perhaps, you know, white culture, right? If you're white, right? Or white male culture in, in like a whiteness patriarchy kind of situation, um, right? So there's this assumption that I could just do whatever I want, you know? So there's that level of it. Um, and then there's also just the very basic uh, kind of unenlightened uh, human aspect where, you know, we are just constantly chasing, 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 or being tossed about by our fears and our anxieties and our, our great hopes, um, our, our tremendous, um, you know, sadnesses, um, you know, all of these things. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Um, uh, let's see. And then Sarah asks, um, could you please speak to any difference in approach or view if you're experiencing intense physical sensations or pain during practice? 
at some point uh, that pain gives way to fear in me. Uh, and so uh, I can have a relationship to that fear, but is there something else to keep in mind or, or not in mind? Um, yeah, thank you for that. So there, there are kind of, you know, various ways of um, approaching pain um, and, and what arises from pain. Um, I've met some some people who, you know, like to try and practice right through it, you know, kind of like like a triathlete who's just going to like work right through the pain. Um, you know, the question really becomes um, almost a question of style. Um, pain, you know, discomfort can arise and, and turn into pain or depending on, you know, our bodies and, and the present situation, just pain can come, right? And um, we can recognize it through wakefulness, right? Just being being able to be present with what's happening. And then if it's clear in the moment that this pain is, is not necessarily going to change, then you know to shift our body. You know, but we want to do this in a way so that we're not just like reacting to every little thing that's arising. And I'm not saying that your pain is little. Um, I don't intend to say that. Um, the again this kind of comes back to learning um uh, it's like any kind of technique like you know how how deep um do we want to to go there's no right answer really about that um the, there can be the recognition of pain and a shift in posture and you know return back to meditation session right the recognition of, of pain can include a little bit of inquiry as to from where does this pain arise? Right? Where does pain go? Like I, you know, this the recognition of an experience of fear arising. You know, where is fear? From where does it arise? When I no longer feel it, where does it go? And again, this is all a way to learn how to better understand, you know, the machinations, the way that the, the mind moves. Right? The mind itself doesn't move, thought activity moves, but how the, how the thoughts come and go. You know, and some are totally, you know, totally almost automatic, like Pavlovian, <laughs> like pain is a good one, where it's just like, pain and then and then perhaps uh, where in the body pain will be will instantly bring us back to a particular experience or memory um, and and again I want to um, kind of emphasize how entering into all of this with a sense of gentleness and self-care is important because um, you know when I was training as a chaplain uh, half the time I in, uh, I spent training was um, with psychiatric patients um, and on locked psych floors. And for one year, I led a meditation group um, uh, on, in a, on a psych ward in the hospital in Manhattan. And um, I would kind of, you know, change up what I was doing from time to time. But there was one time I was just doing kind of like a body scan meditation and um you know so we're just kind of moving down through the body trying to release any stress or anxiety you know that, that's there um and generally it's a very um well received meditation um you know on average working with those populations but but there had been uh someone in the room who had been um sexually assaulted and when we got to the arms where this person had been held down just you know when i was just like you know bring bring your awareness down to your arms and and as that happened she tensed up and she she kind of jumped up and was like you know I, I need to leave and you know it's like okay you know not a problem i'm gonna follow up with you when we're done and afterwards we were talking and she described the whole process uh her of, of her experience and how instantaneously she was kind of brought right back to that terrible experience right so 
you know, we have a lot of things, you know, sometimes trauma, but then also sometimes love, like, you know, we have a tremendous amount of, of experiences connected to our body. Right. So um, it's almost as if we um, kind of store memory in our body in different places. And so, uh, again, you know, as these things um, arise, these experiences, um, if we can keep a as light in the sense of um, not solidifying what's happening um, relationship to them, you know, we can accept them, we can let them come, etc. Um, but we, you know, we don't want to like overly solidify them um, and then take care of ourselves. So if it's time to get up, you know, or time to shift or time to go lay in the grass or, or, or do something to change up your, your experience, um, go ahead and do that. You know, there's, there's not, I don't think there's a tremendous benefit in, um, just powering through. Um, I've never... My teachers never taught that to me. Um, and again, you know, one of my teachers was considered one of the Mahamudra masters, contemporary Mahamudra masters for the, the, the Karmakagya tradition, Boko Rinpoche. And the way he taught us to practice was, um, was to em embrace a sense of gentleness. Because again, you know, all we're doing is returning to our original state you know, to original wakefulness. That's all we're doing. You know, so it, it's kind of an, a, a, a misunderstanding sometimes to be like, I'm going to be really fucking intense about this. Um, you know, because there's nothing to be intense about. You know, again, going back to the bird, like the bird, a bird sitting in a tree isn't like, I'm fucking nailing this. I'm a fucking bird. And I'm being really bird. <laughs> They're just bird. You know, the same way in our meditation, you know, we could be tight and and really want to control the situation. Um, but again, that exertion, that level of exertion um, just totally messes things up. Even though, like, you know, we can all acknowledge that sometimes the, the root of intention with such an approach is positive in the sense of, I really want to be able to experience, you know, awakening, right? I really want to be able to be a benefit to others um, by understanding my own mind. So then I can share that with other people. That's amazing. But then when we're just like, I'm going to do it really intensely, um, you know, I don't know. Um, in the beginning, maybe we go through that to some extent, but I think, you know, over time, we learn that that's um, it's much ado about nothing. <laughs> so, um, hopefully, that was uh, helpful, Sarah. Um, uh, let's see. So, uh, I I don't think there are any more questions. Um, any questions? Any more? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> nice to see you, Wambui. Um, okay, so maybe we can um, do a, a short session, a uh, meditation session. Um, and so, excellent. Yay. Well, we're trying to do some stuff, um, you know, to make things earlier so that people from Helsinki and different parts of Europe and the UK can uh, can and you know join us. Um, so, um, okay. So take a moment uh, again to just get into whatever meditation posture is um, meaningful for you right now. Um, and as you do that, try and remember that what we're doing is um, is easy. So you don't want your experience to be hard and intense. Right? Um, you don't need 
to be doing a lot, right? So, so try and uh, exercise a little love of being. Exercise a sense of acceptance for whatever it is that's arising. And then just gently bring your awareness to your breath. And spend time gently noticing every inhalation and exhalation without judgment. Easy peasy. And as you do that, try and allow yourself to directly apprehend what is arising in this moment without judgment. Without anxiety. Without fear. And then bring your awareness to all of the sounds in the room right now, wherever you are. And try and really stretch your awareness out to notice the qualities without judgment, without fixation of everything that's happening. Then try to extend your awareness even further outside of the space where you're seated. So outside of your home. And if you can, outside of the town where you are right now. And just rest naturally in this experience. So in this moment, allowing yourself to breathe naturally, to accept all sound without reaction, without obsessing over what's arising. And then gently expanding that experience begin to understand where the edges of your mind might be. And gently notice what this experience is like without analysis, without philosophical discourse. Just be right now. Let yourself remain clear 
vast and free. And then slowly bring your awareness back to this wonderful online community. And quietly just notice how that is, what that feels like. And so, fortunately and unfortunately, the ferry is here. So I'm going to have to go. And I apologize for, you know, how weird <laughs> this session is. But I ask you to just take that experience with you. Meet the spaciousness. That gentle being with you into the next thing you do. And if you have any questions or thoughts you want to share with me, you can email me. Um, I'll write my email address down. Please feel free to reach out. And then when we pick this up uh, in the next session, we can go into any questions you might have. So I want to thank you all. Thank you for rolling with the endless change. Be well and have a good um, restful weekend. Bye-bye.